I'm going to do the, the big um, story of earthworm invasion and then first and then kind of get to the specifics about jumping worms because it's important that there are certain impacts of all invasive earthworms on the landscape and on forests and that the jumping worm invasion is coming in in the context of a European earthworm invasion, which was pre-existing, which very much affects what the jumping worms do. Um, and there, there are lots of different worm species in the world. There's about 6,000 and they range from blue earthworms that are 18 inches long and this Gippsland earthworm that's six feet long to little tiny earthworms. Uh, and I'm not the first one to study them. Certainly, I mean, Darwin wrote a whole book about earthworms. It was the last thing that he published just before he died. Um, but as soon as he finished um, Origin of the Species, he spent the rest of his life doing research on earthworms um, and actually discovered quite a lot about them and decided they're the most important organisms um, in terms of the role they've played in the history of the earth and making it what it is today. And you all know about global warming, but there's also global worming. Um, so this map of the continents shows the 17 taxonomic families of earthworms. And on each continent, the blue ones are all native species. The light red ones are some native and some introduced and the red families are ones that are totally introduced taxa. So earthworm invasions are something that's occurring all over the world, um, except for Antarctica, as far as I know but lots of invasive earthworms everywhere, um, which is why it's important to start with a big picture and then narrow down. So in the Eastern US, we had a first wave of earthworm invasion from Europe and they came when European settlers uh, arrived. So in Maine, that was pretty early, I think. Um, it was in the 1840s in Minnesota and now the second wave is jumping worms and uh, the jumping worms come from Asia. Um, the other thing to know about earthworms is there are different functional groups. Um, night crawlers, which I'm sure you have, are anisic. They have a vertical burrow. They go deep in the winter and hibernate. They eat fresh leaves at the surface. Um, and that fresh means leaves that fell the previous autumn. And then endogeic worms make continuous burrows in about the top 15 inches of soil. And they tend not to be pigmented. They're usually called angle worms. Epigeic worms stay right on the surface and live in the leaf litter. Um, the, so the European earthworms, there's actually eight or nine different species in a given forest, including um, the night crawler, several endogeics, and one or two epigeic species. Whereas the jumping worms, it's usually about three species when you're in the northern part of the United States. Uh, we'll get to those later. And they are epiendogeic. They're on the surface, like at the bottom of the leaf litter and just in the top two inches of the mineral soil. So they don't fall in either the epigeic or endogeic. They're epiendogeic. And these are the, some pictures of some of the species. And as I said, the jumping worms are the epi endogenic, so um, in the litter and top of the <clears throat> top of the mineral soil. Um, and in terms of the trophic pyramid, earthworms are decomposers. So most of the dead material that goes into the forest floor or into the garden or whatever is plant matter because plants are at the bottom of the trophic pyramid and basically earthworms are just speeding up the decomposition of leaf litter so that it happens much faster than it does in an ecosystem without earthworms, which was all of the northeastern part of the United States was all earthworm free um, from New England all the way across to Minnesota. There were no earthworms and other species 
did the decomposition, but they did it much more slowly. And basically they decomposed the leaf litter so fast that nutrients are released faster than trees can soak them up. And they leach out of the ecosystem, especially in October when the earthworms are active and the trees are dormant and it's rainy and the worms release the nutrients from the dead leaves and the trees don't take them up and they go down into the groundwater or off into surface water. And that's true for the European worms and the jumping worms. Um, and how did they get here? Well, can you ever imagine how many potted plants were brought here by European settlers, probably billions of them and eggs or even live worms uh, could have been in there. And of course, now the European worms are dispersed all over the place at lake shores because of their use as fishing bait. Uh, whereas the jumping worms are going more to garden areas because they're dispersed by mulch. They don't have the history of being used as fishing bait like the European earthworms. And of course, you have a lot of lakes in Maine like we do in Minnesota, so European worms are everywhere. The jumping worms are not anywhere near as widespread, you know, that that's more of an early stage invasion. It's like the European invasion was maybe a hundred years ago. Chance, could you bring me a couple of tissues? Tissues? Um, so even remote areas like this is the boundary waters of northern Minnesota, which is a very remote wilderness area. Um, it's about the same latitude as the Gas Bay Peninsula. Minnesota is actually situated a little bit further north than Maine, but it has over a thousand lakes just in the boundary waters and all the red and yellow areas you see here have invasive earthworms because they go wherever people go. And these are the most important canoe routes with portages between the lakes. And then the green areas are areas that aren't used by people as much. They're further from the most popular portages and they don't have native earthworms. So if you go far enough north, there's still places that aren't invaded. Probably the northern tip of Maine has some areas that aren't invaded. Um, we've studied earthworms using the leading edge. So we've managed the, to find leading edges of invasion and you can find worms and no worms and you can compare, you can observe as the invading front moves. Um, and now of course the jumping worms are coming on top of the European earthworms. So we have a, a European earthworm base and then the jumping worms are creating an additional leading edge uh, moving through. So that, that's been a really good technique because it would be hard to do an experiment where you could do this on a large scale. And sampling, you can bring worms to the surface with mustard. We use about a, a third of a cup of ground yellow mustard powder in a gallon of water. Mix it just before you use it, pour it on the ground in a frame of known area and you can count the number of worms you get and then you can extrapolate to the number of worms per acre and so on. Um, jumping worms, especially during rainy periods, are right close to the surface and you can just actually go and sort through the soil with your fingers and find them all because they don't go down more than a couple inches. Um, so stages of earthworms. Earthworm free looks like the upper left picture. The uh, forest floor is several inches thick. It feels like walking on a memory foam mattress. The leaves are all bleached in color on top. They're knit together by fungal hyphae um, and it's several inches thick. And of course is a great insulator that keeps the soil cooler. And then as you get into stage two, you have epigeic worms then endogeic worms come in at stage three and then at stage four and five lumbricus terrestris comes in um, and at that point there's no longer an organic horizon the the leaves that fall each autumn are eaten later that fall and in the spring and neck in the following summer um, so that by the end of summer the soil is bare 
Um, and this is what the forest floor of an earthworm free area looks like. So you have fresh leaves on top and then fragmented leaves and then humus and it probably represents 20 or 30 years accumulation in most northern sugar maple forests. Um, and this is one of our experiments where we took chunks of forest floor from an earthworm free area and then introduced worms into it and three weeks later it looked like the picture on the right and the bubbly things are the castings. And you can see a sugar maple seedling there that tipped over because it's rooting medium. It was rooted in the organic rise and it's rooting medium was eaten out from under it. And then this shows how the soil changes. It goes from having those distinct organic horizons to, to um, what looks like a plow layer, which is just a thick black A horizon where the endogeic worms have mixed all the organic matter into the top 10 to 15 inches. Um, and because the soil is bare for part of the year, there's increased erosion rates. The European earthworms actually cause more gully erosion and a little bit of sheet erosion, whereas the jumping worms cause very severe sheet erosion and uh, a lot of trees end up with their root systems exposed if they're growing on slopes like this sugar maple here. And a sugar maple will never grow like this naturally. Um, they don't like having their roots exposed and they're not very happy about the earthworm invasions. So um, this is one of our, our um, study sites in northern Minnesota. And you can see in the aerial photo there, it's on the shore of Leech Lake and there's a resort there where earthworms were introduced for fishing bait and the worms spread from there. And um, we looked at the, um, some of the cations, which are very important for the health of sugar maple, calcium and magnesium especially, and they are leached out um, and the soil is depleted in, in cations. And this has led to dieback of sugar maples, where you see dead branches in the top of the crowns. This is a a uh, research project with 120 different sugar maple forests in Wisconsin, Upper Michigan, and Northern Minnesota there on the other side of Lake Superior. And um, the basal area cumulative growth there from 1950 up to the early 2000s, stage five of invasion, which is when you have the bare forest floor, which you can get from European worms or from jumping worms, um, that's the heavy black line, and it shows about a 30% reduction in growth of basal area compared to forests that don't have invasive worms or that in, are in the very early stages of earthworms, which are the other lines there. Um, and so here's a sugar maple before earthworm invasion, and there's a, like 11 or 12 species of plants visible here. You can see the natural configuration of sugar maple roots and how, you know, where they contact the forest floor. And here is after. So the forest, the organic horizon is receded by several inches here. Um, and you can see the seedling density of sugar maple seedlings is way down. And both the, the European worms and the jumping worms will severely reduce sugar maple seedling abundance as well as the other plants, as you can see. And this maple tree is not very happy and it's no wonder it has that on average, they have about 30% reduction in growth. They have to reorient their whole fine root system, establish new mycorrhizal relationships and it's quite an adjustment and the soils are more droughty because they, are, they aren't insulated at midsummer the way they are before earthworm invasion and it's more nutrient poor and not only are the cations depleted also nitrogen and phosphorus. So not um, the best conditions for sugar maple growth. And then among the native plant species there are winners and losers the sedges 
tend to do okay. Um, some of the losers are native orchids, trilliums, a lot of the native um, woodland wildflowers don't grow very well with either of the invasions. Um, I have a native wildflower garden. I've been able to get more than 20 species of native woodland plants to grow in a jumpy norm infested area on a flat site, um, but not on a hilly site because the soil is too loose and the plants just can't get established. Um, and the last one of the other aspects is both earthworm invasions facilitate invasive plant species. Um, in the Midwest, buckthorn is a big one, which is an invasive shrub, but Japanese barberries and stilt grass and all sorts of, of, um, of plants that are co-evolved with the earthworms on their home continent so that it's not surprising that they grow really well in combination with the earthworms um, are facilitated and are becoming very common. Uh, and I know the barberry and the stilt grass and the swallow word is pretty common in the east, whereas we tend to have buckthorn and garlic mustard and tartary and honeysuckle here, but all of these kind of occur everywhere. They're just some of them are more abundant in some places and some more abundant in others. Um, so the ecological cascades are the structure of the soil and the organic horizon is changed. That changes soil temperature and nutrients are lost. The microbial community is altered and that changes the plant community. Um, and if you change the plant community, you're changing habitat for vertebrate wildlife species. So there are a lot of issues of concern um, to society here, especially the soil and water quality, the loss of forest productivity, the forest floor material is emitted as CO2, so it's a climate change problem. We can't do prescribed burns in a lot of earthworm invaded forests anymore to regenerate oak because without the leaf litter layer, there isn't contiguous fuel and you can't get the flame to move through the forest. So a lot of ecological cascades here that affect forest health um, and the climate warming effect by emitting CO2 exacerbating droughts because without the organic horizon, the soil gets warmer and drier, um, increasing biodiversity losses and facilitating invasive species that all work together with a warmer climate. Um, and here's one invasional meltdown we had in Minnesota where we got European worms and buckthorn came after that in woodlots and they are the overwintering host for soybean aphids, which in turn are the food source for Asian lady beetles, um, which some people are allergic to. And now soybean farmers have to spray for these aphids um, that wouldn't be there without the earthworms. And then we even have European starlings that spread the buckthorn berries around. So it, uh, an entire ecosystem of invasive species. And then this is just the complex, the cascades are very complex and interlinked. Um, invasive earthworms facilitate ragweed, which is the main cause of hay fever allergies. They change the forest floor environment for ticks, which changes the frequency of Lyme disease in both positive and negative ways, depending on the local context. Um, and productivity of crops and forests that I mentioned and biodiversity loss changes in fire regimes. So human health and the economy and the environment are all impacted. Okay, let's get specific about jumping worms now. Uh, there are 14 species in North America, north of Mexico. Amenthus and Metafire are present in Minnesota and the um, Two Amenthus species, um, Amenthus agrestis, Amenthus tokyoensis, um, tokyoensis, and Metafire hilgendorfi, 
And my guess is that exactly the same three species are in Maine. So, um, and I think that's likely because the exact same three species have been found in Vermont. So, and we have studies from Vermont showing that they move around in mulch more so than fishing bait. They can be used as fishing bait, but it's more mulch and also nursery stock. Uh, ball and burlap nursery stock can move them around. They're more aggressive than the European worms. And um, they are annual species. At least the three that are most common are annual species. So they survive the winter as eggs, whereas the European species um, can live for years if something doesn't eat them. Night crawlers can live for many years. So they are, are perennial species and they go down and hibernate beneath the frost line. Um, and if they by chance do get frozen, their eggs are much more tolerant of temperature extremes. And that's also true of the jumping worms that the, the cocoons, which mostly have one egg in them for jumping worms, sometimes two, but mostly one. Little cocoons, I'll show some pictures of them in a minute, um, can survive temperatures well below zero and it doesn't very often get that cold in the soil. So it's pretty hard to kill them. They can survive droughts in summer. So if you have a drought period where the adult worms can't be active and they die from drought, the eggs will survive and, and still hatch after the drought. Um, and how to tell a, a European worm from a jumping worm. So the clitellums, if you're looking at a mature worm, so this would be mid to late summer. A lot of worms are new hatchlings in the spring. It's not very easy to ID them then, but later in the summer when they have that band around them, which is the clitellum, it's much further back on a European species, anywhere from the 23rd to the 32nd segment from the nose of the worm, depending which species. Whereas on the jumping worm, it starts at segment 14 or 15, as you can see in the picture there. And also on the jumping worm, it's annular, which means it goes all the way around the worm, whereas on the European worms, it's like a saddle. So in this picture, you're looking at the top of the worm. If you roll it over and look at the, the um, <clears throat> dorsal, or no, the ventral surface, um, it doesn't go all the way around. It's like a saddle that sits on the worm. Um, and then here's the life cycle of jumping worms. So basically, if you have an early spring, they'll start hatching in April, but most of the time, if you're in the northern areas, it's early May. And they're juveniles through June, and then they're adults from July through October, and then they die when it freezes. They are unable to go deep in the soil, so as soon as you get a really hard freeze, they die. Sometimes if you get snow before uh, the soil freezes, they'll survive under the snow for a while into November, but basically in late October or November they die, but they've laid lots of cocoons, and the top two inches of the soil is full of those cocoons. Um, and as I said, they move around in mulch. Uh, I, I've seen them in baked commercial mulch, which is heat treated. Um, it's required to be heat treated before commercial distribution. But I think what happens is the bags get tears in them when they're stored and they're stored outside and the worms go back in. Jumping worms can apparently smell somehow uh, wood chip mulch especially, um, and will find it uh, if they're anywhere in the vicinity. And we know that because at the Arboretum in Minnesota, they trim all their trees in late winter, and then they feed the branches into a chipper and make chips, wood chips that they use for mulch. And they made a pile in the middle of an asphalt parking lot and two weeks later, they were filled with jumping worms, which apparently crawled across the parking lot on a rainy night. So, 
So they can smell or sense, I mean, their sense of smell isn't like ours, um, but they can sense the presence of mulch from quite some distance and will make their way to it um, as soon as it's installed. So a lot of people actually blame a landscape company because the jumping worms appear right after they get new mulch and the mulch is probably clean and it's just that the, if the worms are present in, present in your neighborhood, they find the mulch. Um, and, all, and of course in nursery stock, especially ball and burlap, and we do have a research program at the nursery at the University of Minnesota Arboretum testing different chemicals like sluggo and which is for slugs and saponins and so on in nursery stock to, to see if they can find a good treatment that's relatively benign in terms of environmental impact that can ensure that nursery stock is free of worms and that project is just getting underway um, and Aaron Buckholz, who's a, a pest specialist at the Minnesota Arboretum, is, um, knows a lot more about that particular project. Community mulch piles are a problem. Um, we have community mulch piles where people from the whole city take their leaves uh, in the fall and dump them there. And if you have jumping worms there, when the compost gets distributed the next year, it might go to a thousand different houses. Um, so the city in Minneapolis is, is trying to figure out how to heat treat their mulch piles so that they won't be distributing jumping worms. And one thing we're worried about is that people who live in the city will take plants from the city with jumping worms in the soil to cabins in remote areas. And I know you have a lot of cabins on lakes in northern Maine. And that jumping worms will get distributed to remote areas where they will infest, um, you know, our big tracts of northern forests. So that is a big concern. And um, you know, in Maine, you should definitely try to do something about that in terms of education. Um, so here are the cocoons, Tokyoensis cocoons at right. Um, two or three millimeters, Agrestus cocoons at the left or in the middle. I'm not sure about this big cocoon, if that's one that happens to have two eggs in or if that's actually a Metafire um, Hilgendorfi, which is the biggest of the, of the um, jumping worms. It, it might be, um, but you can see they're almost round, but not quite. And they have a little tiny point on them and they're made of silk and almost always have one egg in. If you cut one open in the spring, there will be a little green worm in there that's like a quarter inch long, like a little green piece of thread, but they do turn the, to their normal color just before they hatch out. And these cocoons can be spread by wildlife. They will stick to the hooves of deer, for example and they will go downhill with water flow um, in snow melt or during thunderstorms with heavy rain. And we know that because we had a jumping worm infestation on campus in St. Paul and the gardens from campus all the way down to Como Avenue, which is about six blocks all downhill, were all infested after we had a heavy thunderstorm with three inches of rain and the, all the gardens all the way down six blocks downhill, ended up with jumping worms. And it was clearly water flow. And this is the ed maps. Um, and I know that jumping worms are underreported in New England. So, and I don't see any reports in Maine. Uh, and the reason there are these big areas of reports in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Illinois is because of my research program and the research program at the University of Wisconsin Arboretum in Madison. Um, and I'm not sure who's responsible for Illinois there, but I think coverage from here all the way out to the East Coast would be the same as it is in Wisconsin, Minnesota, Illinois. It's just that 
there aren't people who have reported them to EDMAPS. Um, and I see it, there are now reports in Ontario as well, um, around the Toronto area, especially there and the Detroit area, just across the river from Detroit. And I'm pretty sure all of Southern Michigan is infested that there just isn't a researcher there who is encouraging reports. What we did is we talked to all the master gardener groups in Minnesota and Wisconsin and asked them to report if they saw them. And what they do is they send a picture um, to the coordinator at the DNR, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. And she then asked me, is this a jumping worm? And if I say yes, then she enters it as an EDMAPS report with the exact location. And um, so obviously nobody in Michigan has done that. I'm sure it's infested. And I'm sure New York and Massachusetts are as well. So talk to your master gardeners and ask them to do reports um, to learn how to, to identify them and report them so that we get better information on their distribution in New England. Um, these are the granules that they produce. So European earthworms actually raise the bulk density of soil and they make the surface quite hard. Um, whereas jumping worms make the soil loose granules like cat litter. And that's why erosion on slopes is so massive because these granules are not attached to each other. They're just loose. And we actually have one hill in a sugar maple forest in the University of Minnesota Arboretum. Very steep hill and you can stand at the top and kind of wiggle your feet a little and you will just slide down like you were on an escalator because these are like little ball bearings. Uh, and the granules are biggest for Metafire and medium sized for Amynthus agrestis and smallest for Amynthus tokioensis. Um, about one third of all our mulched beds on campus and at the Arboretum are full of jumping worms and we went to the master mulch pile for the university and it was filled with jumping worms so they are spreading them to all of our garden beds from the master mulch pile. And here's the, this is the University of Minnesota Arboretum and you see the parking lot there at the entrance. And these are the display garden beds that have their displays of perennials mostly. Um, like they have every species of plant that will grow in the Minnesota climate from all over the world. And all of the red ones have a menthus, uh, I think. Yeah, and the blue ones didn't. Um, and they had the same problem. They were getting them into all of their mulch garden beds from their master mulch pile. So um, as you can see, it's a, a lot of the garden beds are infested. And they are moving into the forest on the left side of the picture there. It goes into a maple forest, and that's actually the one where they make their maple syrup, which is now infested. And uh, here's one of the forests at the Arboretum. And this is our field control experiment, which we started in 2021, where we have replicates of several different um, control methods, including saponin, sulfur granules, diatomaceous earth, botanigard. Um, um, we should have results from that soon. The nursery experiment is actually using more things the one where they're trying to see what will remove them from ball and burlap nursery stock. Um, I know saponins kills them. It's just a matter of whether you can distribute it in the right way. Um, so we'll see. We're in the process of analyzing the data. I, but I think saponins kill them and it they are safe for people because saponins are in tea leaves and it's a byproduct of the manufacture of tea. Uh, we also had some plots where we just removed the leaf litter and that also did a good job of reducing the population of jumping worms. And we do have some gardens on the Greenway where I live in Minneapolis where we removed mulch 
three years ago and there are no longer jumping worms there, but we also had a bad drought three summers in a row, but they did persist in areas that had mulch. So if you have a drought and you remove mulch, that seems to wipe them out. Um, oh, here, these are our leading edge of invasions of jumping worms at the Arboretum, three of them, wood duck forest, magnolia forest, uh, which is not a magnolia forest. It's actually a maple forest, which is called the magnolia forest um, because their magnolia display is across the street. And then the Acer forest where they make their maple syrup. So these are all leading edges where we can observe the jumping worms moving through the forest in areas with and without them. Um, and this is uh, looks like an Amenthus tokyoensis here from the Arboretum. Um, and one thing we found, and this is in a paper in review for publication, is that they reduce the bulk density um, in the top five centimeters, which is two inches and also two to four inches, not so much at, at four to six inches. And comparing it to the lumbricus, which is red, so the European infested areas, they reduce the bulk density quite a bit. But the European lumbricus worms raised the bulk density when they invaded, and essentially the uh, minthus are putting it back to where it was before the European earthworms invaded. Um, and if it wasn't for the fact that they were causing the soil to completely erode away, that would be a great thing. <laughs> uh, and then here's summer temperature. They cool the soil temperature as much as four degrees. See, if you look at the red line there, this is daily, or actually I think this is like um, probably every hour or every two hours all summer. And the red is amenthus. They cool it as much as four degrees Celsius. And that's because there are air spaces between those granules. Whereas with the European earthworms, the soil is one mass, which is a better conductor of heat. And again, the European earthworms probably raised the temperature. In fact, we have some new research on that, that they raise soil temperatures one to two degrees Celsius, and now the um, jumping worms are cooling it that much uh, by making it back into a better insulator. Um, we're looking at the effects on native forest plant communities. Um, and we only have three hectares or seven and a half acres. This is a species area curve here, and the red line goes out to seven and a half acres because that's how much jumping worm infestation we have. But if you look at the European earthworm species area curve, you'll see that we're missing about 25 species of native plants at um, a three and a uh, seven and a half acre spatial scale. And that's not good news because when the European earthworms invaded, they reduced the diversity. And now when the jumping worms invade, they're reducing it even more. Um, if there was a no earthworm curve here, it would be above that blue line and it would probably be 50 species higher than, than the red line. Um, so they, they are filters on the establishment of native plants, probably at the seed germination um, stage of the life cycle. We are doing an experiment where we're planting mature plants because we think the soil is so loose in those granules that seedlings just don't ever, aren't able to, to um, just take hold in the soil. But we are doing experiments where we're planting mature plants and see if we can get past that bottleneck and if it's possible to restore the native plant understory, which is wiped out completely when the European earthworms invaded. Um, followed by high deer populations and then the, the jumping worm invasion, those three things coming one after another totally wiped it out. Um, and then we're also looking at whether they are, the jumping worms are replacing the European worms. And this is a complicated graph, but the answer is yes, these are transects. 
Um, and if you look at T1, for example, as you go from left to right, the, the purple and the orange would be European species. And as you go down the transect, it gets to be just a minthus, which is green. Um, and so the Lumbricus terrestris, the night crawler, disappears when the jumping worms invade. And the only European species that stay are the Aparectidae, and those are the endogeic, the ones that live deep in the soil, um, which are purple on this graph. So those are remaining because they're physically separated from the jumping worms that are only in the top two or three inches. Um, the night crawlers feed at the surface and they apparently can't compete with the jumping worms, so they disappear. So this is a unique earthworm community now made up of some European species and some of the Asian jumping worm species. And here again is the soil erosion and you see an unhappy sugar maple tree here that doesn't want its roots to be exposed like that. And we just started a grant research project. We got a $430,000 grant from our Minnesota Invasive Plant and Pest Center um, that started in January and we're actually measuring soil erosion rates with and without jumping worms. And we're using native plant plantings to see if we can slow the erosion rate. And uh, so just to summarize, this is what European earthworm infested soil looks like in the forest. Um, the leaves are gone by early summer. The surface is quite hard. All those little lumps are middens of night crawlers, which are the piles of the petioles of the leaves that they were eating. They didn't want to eat the petioles, so they just discard them outside their burrow. Um, and during dry periods, this is very hard, very high bulk density, very warm. And then this is with the jumping worms they don't eat the leaf litter until July or August, whereas the European earthworms will eat the leaf litter in May and June. So the leaf litter stays a little bit longer into the season because the jumping worms are new hatchlings and they don't get big enough to eat leaves until um, July. And so in this picture, you see there's still some leaf litter present. This is a totally jumping worm infested area. And you see a, um, a tree here with exposed roots because of the massive erosion. This is actually on a slope, which is like 25 degrees. Um, and so that's what I plan to say. And I imagine there might be a question or two. So I will um, stop share and, and if, let's see. Do you see those questions, Kathy? Yeah, or I do. So um, Lynn kindly uh, put a link to the maps of the counties or the, I guess, towns and counties where um, jumping worms have been reported. So we do have a system for recording that. Unfortunately, it's not um, showing up on the, the EDD maps. So Yeah, th there's also an iNaturalist map. Oh, okay. Which might show it in different areas. Yeah. Okay. So then so let's just get to some of the questions. Then let's talk about what uh, predators there are for jumping worms and uh, are salamanders among them? <laughs> um, yes. Salamanders will eat jumping worms, um, especially when, they're, when the worms are smaller in the spring when they're hatching. Um, depends what species of salamander and some of the jumping worm species get pretty big and pretty aggressive um, later in the season. And my guess is salamanders don't catch many of them then, but um, jumping worms are often caught by a predator, which could be a salamander, um, could be a shrew, could be a mole, um, could be various small mammals. They jumping worms move pretty fast. Um, you know, they're just incredibly fast. And if a predator grabs the end of their tail, they will shed 
the last 10 segments and keep moving and so the predator gets a good bite for you know a small meal and the worm will grow a new tail later and actually if you take them in your hand sometimes they'll jump out of your hand and just leave the tail there um, so yeah there are a lot of predators and um, at the arboretum turkeys and i imagine you have wild turkey and one of the problems is the turkeys will root around with their beaks and their feet to expose the worms and in the process they'll kill any seedlings of plants that are germinating. And that is a big problem and we think that's one of the reasons why seedlings of the native woodland plants just are not reappearing after after invasion by jumping worms because the turkeys are walking around and stirring up all those granules and the seedlings just don't ever get their roots in the solid soil. So um, how about birds other than turkeys? Oh yeah, robins and yeah, yeah there, there are actually a lot of birds that will eat them. Um, the problem is they are more prolific at laying eggs and through millions of years of evolution they have become more prolific than they're in reproducing uh, at their reproductive rate than the rate at which they are eaten by predators. And they obviously had to solve that problem in the, their evolutionary history or they wouldn't be here. Okay, so a question about the eggs and how long do they persist uh, in the soil? Yeah, so the eggs are laid in, uh, they could be laid in July, August, September, a given worm will, will lay an egg or two each week. So if you have like 100,000 worms per acre, you, you might be getting 100 or 200,000 if it's a nice rainy summer eggs um, being laid every week in the late, later part of the summer. So there are a lot of them. And a lot of them will hatch the following sp spring, but not all of them. Some will wait a year before they hatch. Some will wait until mid or late summer. If you get a drought, they will stay dormant and hatch when the drought ends. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's another thing in their evolutionary history is just like with the seeds of invasive plant species, they don't all germinate at once. Some will germinate or some will hatch the following year. And that's just, that's their evolutionary strategy that they've developed to deal with the fact that one summer might be a major drought. And, you know, earthworms are a mucous membrane on the outside of the worm, like the inside of your mouth. They have to be wet. And if an entire season is a drought, they will get through it with eggs. They will not all hatch. Okay, and then uh, you did mention that the worms disappear if you remove the leaf litter uh, or the yep. mulch. So do you yep. think that they actually die or do they move to another area? I think both, yeah. they. Um, They'll move if they can, if they can find another place that still has something that will keep them moist. Um, but they'll, yeah. But if they can't, they'll die and they'll leave areas, especially if you do it at midsummer when it's a heat wave. Although you can also do it in spring and we've actually had some success getting rid of them in, in um, people's gardens in the city by putting black plastic sheets on the soil in the spring. And I think you might actually be able to get it hot enough to even kill the eggs, um, which is about 104 degrees. And because they're all in the top two inches of soil, you could probably, at least if you're on the south side of the house or a south facing hill, in May, when the days are so long, you could probably get the top two inches of the soil that hot if you remove the mulch and put plastic sheeting there. 
Um, the adult worms are killed by 85 degrees, believe it or not. So um, that's why jumping worms love irrigated lawns because irrigated lawns with the water sprayed on them every day never get very hot. It's why they like gardens with thick mulch where the soil never gets that hot. It's why they like north and east facing slopes in the forest more than south and west facing slopes because east and north facing slopes at higher latitudes, the soil stays quite cool all summer. So did you mention how long to leave the plastic in place for solarizing? Well, measure the temperature, to leave, it, leave it in place long enough to get the temperature up, to, um, you know, over 100 for several hours. So a few, a few days probably. And then another person is asking if uh, you would recommend clearing your yard and gardens of leaves in the fall. Oh boy, that's a hard question because <laughs> I like to use natural gardening. So I have a woodland wildflower garden outside of my condo here. It's 150 feet long. It has 30 species of native plants. Um, it's filled with woodland flocks and trilliums and it, and believe it or not, right now, the shorts aster is in bloom. I can't believe that it has not been cold enough in Minnesota to kill. But anyway, it's totally infested with jumping worms. It's on the north side of the building so that it stays cool all summer. And I decided to leave the leaves and let the worms eat them and release the nutrients because it's a flat site. Um, if it was a hill slope, the soil would be gone and none of the species of plants would be able to take root, uh, but it's a flat site. So I decided to try living with the worms and it's working pretty well, except that we had a drought in September. We didn't get one drop of rain the whole month of September. And there's one part of the garden that stays a little wetter than the rest. And they all gathered there and killed a bunch of the plants because mm -hmm. they got to high density. And I've also seen that on hostas during gradually developing droughts. We had a hosta garden in the city park next to my building. And this was several years ago and there was a gradual drought and the worms gradually coalesced on the roots under the hostas and ate all the fine roots and they died. And I went out there one day and the hostas looked weird and I, you could just pick it up off the soil. It was not connected. Um, so the, the main time that they cause mortality in gardens where you plant plants and you're, you're bypassing the seed germination stage by planting a mature plant is when you have a gradually developing drought and a mass of worms will accumulate underneath the plants as the drought develops. So you're actually better off to water the garden and let the worms stay dispersed, which I would have done. Um, but I was a little bit too late. They oh. didn't kill the short saster though, um, but they killed all the bed straw. I had a nice carpet of bed straw in between the bigger plants and they killed that, just totally killed it. So a couple more thing, questions here. So as far as the frass goes, does that eventually break down and have, and supply the nutrients back uh, to the yep. plants? Yeah, the, and the nutrients leach out of the castings on rainy days. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of how long does it take those granules to break down well, one of the gardens where we removed all the mulch and the leaves and the worms left, um, you could still see the granules for the following three summers. It and by the end of the third summer, there were very few. The first summer, it was just like the worms were still there, even though they weren't. The granules were still very prominent. The second summer, kind of medium. And by the end of the third summer, they were almost all gone. 
So those granules are fairly persistent even after the worms are gone. And would you recommend removing wood chips from pathways? Um, um, well, the, yeah, again, the Arboretum, the University of Minnesota Arboretum has several miles of hiking trails because not only do they have display gardens, they have several hundred acres of natural vegetation of forest and wetland. Um, and they do a lot of research on rare native plants there. And they've chosen to, to wood chip mulch all of the trails and all of the trails have lots of jumping worms under that mulch. Because if you remove the mulch, then you get so much soil compaction by all the people walking. And so they decided to live with it, but they're also doing the research on which chemicals control the worms. So maybe they will ultimately treat the trails. Well, they'd have a captive audience then because they'd all be under the trails, I guess. Yep. <laughs> okay, so one, uh, one last question, I think, about clear plastic versus black plastic for solarizing. You... I think they both work pretty well. I mean, the clear is like a little greenhouse and the, so the soil absorbs the heat and the plastic holds it in and the black absorbs the heat it, itself and radiates it into the soil. They both work. Okay, I think that's it. Unless anybody wants to unmute themselves and I'm sorry, did we get the question. did we get the earlier question about um besides the salamanders, any natural predators of jumping worms, birds? Did we get yeah, that one? Yeah. We did. Okay, I missed it. Yeah. 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 I, I should also mention that we got a grant to build um a facility where we can do prescribed burns in a laboratory setting. Oh. And I, th I think we're gonna do some experiments where we pile on mulch and leaves and light a prescribed burn and see if we can get the soil hot enough to kill the worms that way. I mean, the, the heat would have to go down two inches of the, into the soil. And I think if leaves are piled on deep enough, we could accomplish that. Hmm. So that's gonna be fun. Um, and the uh, people in the engineering department are going to build it. There's no way I'd be able to build something like that. All right. So that sounds like a great project. So we will try to put the uh, links to the Aaron Buckholz research, who's doing the uh, research at the Arboretum on the nursery stock. We'll probably try to get an email out to everybody about that so you, you can have that information. And um, I guess with that, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Freilich, for uh, all your the time and all the wonderful information you just gave us. Yeah, uh, you're welcome. Great.